Bible, turn back to Mark chapter 11, uh, Mark chapter 10, sorry. Mark chapter 10. Um, it just struck me this week, actually, and I'm sort of saying this to those of you who've been around church for a long time, that for some people in our church, this is the first Easter week as a Christian. Isn't that amazing? We've got people in our church who've only just recently been saved. And uh, that's amazing. And it's a testimony of God's power at work, isn't it? And I, my, my desire is that we're just really expectant this week, that we really expect God to move, that we really believe that God is, is, going, to, is, is going to save more. And that as he does that, we as believers are increasingly strengthened and uh, increasingly delighted in who he is. So it's Palm Sunday. So again, some of this language might be new to, to some people. Um, Palm Sunday, it's called Palm Sunday because as we just sung in that hymn, the people in Jerusalem chopped down palm branches. And it was a sign in that culture when you wave palm, palm branches, it was just joy and celebration. More on that uh, tonight, we're going we're gonna to refer quite a bit, I think, to Palm Sunday this morning. But I want to get into the meat of Palm Sunday tonight, so plan to be here tonight, if you can. Uh, what I want to do, just for the next little while, is look at one of the events that led up to the event that began the events of Easter week. Uh, all, uh, well, th- the first three Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark and Luke, all record this event as happening just before Jesus uh, went into Jerusalem. It's the last event uh, of Jesus before he goes into Jerusalem, although Luke tells us he meets Zacchaeus um, in between this event and Palm Sunday. But it's the last kind of ma- major thing that Jesus does before he goes into Jerusalem. Of course, John also talks about the, ra- the raising of Lazarus, and actually a lot of the crowds are coming in because they want to see Jesus, they want to see Lazarus. Um, but three of the Gospel writers choose to talk about the healing of this blind man, Bartimaeus. Matthew has two blind men, but Mark and Luke just record one man. We assume that's because this man, Bartimaeus, is the spokesman. So don't worry about the fact that Matthew has two blind men being healed. Mark and Luke just have one. That's, uh, that's just the way the, the writers have recorded that uh, bit of detail. But we're going to go through Mark's count uh, this morning and this evening. And uh, actually what I want to show you, uh, amongst other things, is that Bartimaeus, this blind beggar, He sets the tone for what's going to happen when Jesus gets into Jerusalem. He's going to say things and do things that the crowd will then replicate on Palm Sunday. So we're in uh, the ancient city of Jericho. It's about 15 miles away from Jerusalem. It's not 15 miles. That's 15 miles as the crow flies. It's a long, windy path uh, to get from Jericho to Jerusalem. Uh, It's a several... several, uh, day journey really so this event in uh, mark chapter 10 46 and following is either happening days before palm sunday it might be a few a, a week or two uh, we're not told but jesus is on his way now to uh, jerusalem to ride into the city um and uh, what i want to just do is show you five things um this morning about blind bartimaeus uh, so we're going to go through this uh, short account of the healing of blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, 46 and following. And I'll point these five things out to you for if you're taking notes. The second point is, is the long point. The first one and the last uh, three are relatively shorter. So that we'll, the second point is the bit that, uh, that uh, we'll spend a bit more time on. But the first point I want to make about blind Bartimaeus, the first thing I want to show you is his pitiful condition. His pitiful condition. Look at verse 46. As they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the side of the road. So we meet this pitiful blind beggar, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, and he sat down by the roadside. We know that Jesus has had, almost since he started his ministry three years earlier, he's always had a great crowd following, following him, hasn't he? He's always had the crowd wanting his miracles, wanting his feeding, wanting his teaching. <clears throat> and it's no surprise to see that there's a crowd following him from uh, Jericho, uh, to Jericho, Jericho into Jerusalem. Um, if you go back to chapter 10, uh, verse 32, we, we, we see there that they were going on the road up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. 
And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And he began, uh, taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. And he explains what's going to happen to him in verse 33. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. So they're on the road. They're coming down from the, the north in Galilee, around Capernaum and Nazareth. They're coming down south. Uh, they're sort of heading east to where Jericho is, and then they'll turn inland uh, 15 miles to Jerusalem. Um, so chapter 10, verse 32 Uh, verse 33 see we're going up to Jerusalem the son of man this is what's going to happen will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him and after three days he will rise so Jesus is clear about what's happening as they go to Jerusalem some days maybe a couple of weeks even before Palm Sunday and actually if you go to chapter 10 verse 1 Here's the crowds. He left there, that's the region in the North Galilee, and he went to the region of of Judea down south, beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered, there's the crowds, they gathered to him again, and again, as as was his custom, he taught them. So by the time we get to chapter 10, verse 46, they're in Jericho, and the crowd is with him, and this pitiful beggar, uh, is. we meet him. And we find out a few things about him. We find out his name is Bartimaeus, but we find out he's blind, There were a lot of blind people in that culture. To be blind was common because there was so much disease and uh, just just so many ways people became blind. But blindness wasn't looked upon favourably at all in that culture. People tended to think if you were blind it's because you'd sinned or because your parents had sinned or because there was some generational curse upon your family and you were paying for the sins of uh, your uh, your family. Um, And... um, Jesus elsewhere, I think John's Gospel explains that's just not the case. But uh, blind people were, were, were kind of, along with lepers, just the low life, really. No one had any use for a blind person. And so we also read that not only is Bartimaeus blind, he's a beggar, um, because that's all, uh, that's all you could do if you were uh, blind. The only thing you could do is beg. Um, there's no other way you're going to get any money. And the other thing I want you to notice about Bartimaeus is not only is he blind, not only is he a beggar, um, not only is his condition pitiful because of those two reasons, but I want you just to see his pitiful condition because of where he's placed. He's sitting by the road. The only reason he'd be sitting by the road was to beg. Yeah, so this poor chap is a blind beggar. He sat in a ditch waiting for people to give him money. And Jericho was a bit of a mecca for blind people because Jericho was full of medicinal plants, various kinds of herbs, had a beautiful smell, um, and these things were said to have medicinal properties. So blind people would have lined this road, and Jesus is passing by. So that's his pitiful condition. Secondly, his persistent cry. Notice what happens in verses 47 to 49. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So you'll notice there his persistent cry, son of David, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let's just spend a bit of time then on this second point, longest amount of time on this point. Now, I've never spoken to a blind person about their other senses. You might have done. But I understand that, from what I'm told, that somebody who is blind tends to have more acute senses elsewhere. Their sense of hearing, in particular, will be very, very sensitive. Um, and um, I think that's interesting. I think that's true. Um, if you're blind, you're using your other senses. Senses aren't to, to get on with your daily life. And this sense of hearing is important. Did you see in verse 47 that although Bartimaeus is blind, he can hear. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, So he's blind, but he's got his ears. There's nothing wrong with his hearing. He's heard that Jesus of Nazareth is in town. Now, all we know, remember his pitiful condition, all we know about Bartimaeus is that he's sitting by the side of the road. We don't know at this point in verse 47 where Jesus is. Jesus might still be some way off with the crowd. But he's hearing the name of Jesus. Maybe he's, hearing the, maybe he's hearing Jesus' voice. Maybe he can pick it out. But he's certainly hearing people speaking the name of Jesus. And there's Bartimaeus sitting by the side of the road. He hears of Jesus 
and he begins to respond to the name of Jesus. Something about this pitiful beggar changes as Jesus draws near. It's interesting, it says in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians was written by a man called Paul, some years after Jesus had risen from the dead and gone back to heaven. So some decades later, Apostle Paul's writing to a church in Philippi that he set up and planted. And at the end of, uh, and in chapter 4 of Philippians, right at the end of verse 5 going into verse 6, it says, the Lord is at hand. Or some versions say the Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. And it says in Mark's, Mark's account there that as Jesus of Nazareth drew near, he hears, doesn't he? He hears Jesus and things change. Paul is saying to us as a church, the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. In fact, before that, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, <laughs> rejoice. Let your reasonableness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with supplication, present your requests to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in the Lord Jesus Christ. Barty was not a particular... Let's call him Barty. It was not a particularly peaceful man. He was a pitiful, wretched, blind beggar. But Jesus is drawing near. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, things change. When the Lord Jesus draws near, whoever you are, let me tell you this, the most pitiful, anxious, downcast person, the loneliest, most fearful, rejected person, the most despised nobodies begin to rejoice when the name of Jesus is spoken. When you and I speak the name of Jesus in the hearing of others, when you and I bring Jesus near and bring him and his name and all that that means into our families, into our communities, into our contexts, into our culture, things there change. Things change when Jesus shows up. We're told about Barty's sense of hearing. But I wonder too, and I'm kind of going into slightly sanctified imagination territory here, go with me. I wonder though if Barty's sense of touch was also heightened. I can imagine him sitting on the ground on that hard Middle Eastern baked parched earth. Maybe his hands are on the ground as he leans back on them. And he can feel the vibrations of the crowd with Jesus in it, speaking the name of Jesus, getting closer. I wonder if he can feel the presence of Jesus coming nearer to him as he hears good news. Jesus is close by. He can hear the name. He can feel Jesus coming. Again, Paul after Jesus had risen from the dead, goes out and he's going doing a missionary tour and he finds himself in Greece on one occasion. And he's talking to a crowd of people in Athens and uh, he's preaching to them. And it says this, he, he says this to them in Acts chapter 17, verse 27. He's talking to all these very clever scholarly philosopher types in Athens. And Paul says to them that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him yet he's not far from each one of us there's that sense isn't there that Bartimaeus is he's hearing that Jesus is near he knows as Paul says to the Greeks he's not far away Jesus is close by he's not he's near so you're you you need to respond this morning you need to reach out you need to feel your way to Jesus Seek God, perhaps feel your way toward him this morning. Find him this morning. Yet he is not far from each one of us. So dear old Barty, he gets this. He says, I'm blind, I'm lost, I'm pitiful. I'm utterly helpless. But Jesus, he knows, is the only one that can save him. And he's saying, Jesus is near to me. All I need to do, all I need to do is reach out and touch him. And of course, there's a lesson here for us, isn't there, as well? I mean, this is just a recording of events that happen, historical, factual events that have happened. But it's so much more than that, friends. Because the truth is that without Jesus, you and I are blind. You might have no problem with your optics this morning, but you have a problem with your soul. 
Your heart, your soul is hard. You are spiritually blind. We are all without Jesus, all of us, spiritually blind. We are all pitiful beggars in the sight of a holy, perfect, almighty God. We are lost. We are utterly helpless. I, I'm spiritually blind. There's nothing wrong with my optics. I'm nearly 50. and I've, I don't have to wear glasses. Woo, how about that? How long will that last? But without Jesus, I'm blind. I'm unable to see. I'm unable to see the horror of my sin. I'm unable to see the beauty of my saviour. And I need help to see. I need somebody, please, I am desperate for somebody to speak the name of Jesus to me in my hearing. And when I hear the Saviour's name, I must take the opportunity. I must acknowledge he is near. I must reach out to him and ask him to cure my spiritual blindness and make me see again how wonderful he is even with the ugliness of my sin now made so apparent and visible to me. Friends, this Easter time, this Easter week, will you hear the name of Jesus? His name means he shall save his people from their sins. Do you feel the saviour near to you this morning? Reach out to him, touch him, he's waiting. The name of Jesus is being spoken. By the way, we're not told that Jesus ever went back to this ancient city of Jericho. This was the only opportunity Bartimaeus had to cry out to Jesus. If he hadn't done it, the the opportunity would have gone. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today you might not get an opportunity to hear the name of Jesus again. You just might not. If you're not a Christian, you need to come to Jesus this morning. You need to ask him to open your eyes to the horror of your sin, the horror of your eternal destiny, but the beauty of of who he is. And he will speak to you. As you hear the name of Jesus spoken, Jesus will speak your name and Jesus will call you And he will save you by opening your eyes. That's what he does, does Bartimaeus. As soon as he hears someone speak the name of Jesus, he loses all his inhibitions. Look at this in verse 47. Here's this persistent cry, the second point. Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And and again, he's sitting by the road. I don't know how far away Jesus is. He still might be a mile down the road. He's just heard someone speak the name of Jesus. And he responds instantly. Maybe Jesus is right there. Maybe someone's tapped him on the shoulder. When I tap you on the shoulder three times, Bartimaeus, Jesus is like 300 yards away. Start shouting then. I don't think so. I think he's just crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I'm going to keep on calling until you reach me, until you hear me, until you respond to me. So all his inhibitions go. This is a a personal saviour. And you need to personally ask Jesus to save you. He is calling to you and he wants you to respond to him by name. Just as Bartimaeus did, Jesus son of David. That's very Palm Sunday-esque, that son of David title that you get, because it's very Old Testament-esque, and it's very fulfillment of prophecy-esque. It's a messianic title. Jesus is the son of David. He is great David's greater son. Um, But Bartimaeus knows that. Bartimaeus also knows that Jesus is greater than David. Um, So there's loads of stuff we could read about this, but Isaiah uh, 42, verses 6 and 7, says this of Jesus. I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Here we go. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness... And in in, in the next chapter, Isaiah 43, there's this call in verse 8, bring out the people who who are blind, yet have eyes. 
This is what the promise of the Messiah, the son of David, is going to do. And, 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 and he gets that. It says there uh, in verse 48, many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. That's what happens when you speak the name of Jesus. There will be people who don't like it. There will be people who rebuke you. And effectively, what this crowd are doing is saying to Bartimaeus, will you shut the up? Because we're not interested in you. Today's not the day for miracles. We're trying to get this Jesus into Jerusalem because he's the Messiah. Well done for noticing that. We want to crown him as king. This isn't the day for lowlife like you to be crying out, shut up, be quiet. Praise God, praise God that we don't really experience that kind of hostility in our country. We, we do, people do, but it's not as bad as in some countries where people will raise a weapon to you if you don't shut up. What's the Bible, what does the Bible say that we are to do when we speak the name of Jesus but the crowds say shut up? The Bible seems to say don't shut up. Cry out even more. Keep on going. The Bible doesn't say, oh yeah, just be sensitive to the culture. Be sensitive to the fact they might be of a different faith. Be sensitive to the, you know, their needs. Cry out even louder. So again, this is what happened after Jesus uh, went back to heaven and the early church was born and uh, the, um, the apostles were preaching and they're getting, they're being told left and right and centre to shut up. Just be quiet. And on one occasion... Uh, Peter and John are arrested and they're taken to court for, for preaching. And uh, this is what it says in Acts 4, verse 18. So they called them, Peter and John, and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Nothing is going to stop the bold Christian from speaking the name of Jesus because they know it's too important. You've got to keep on going. To cry out loudly and boldly and publicly is very clarifying for me. It helps me formulate the kind of church I want us to be. I think we're a church that is very good, has become, under God's goodness, very good at evangelism. We have a great team of people in various contexts evangelizing and, and I know many of you in your context in your homes in your schools in your unis in your workplaces wherever in your families are evangelizing speaking the name of Jesus I wonder sometimes if we would have the same enthusiasm for speaking Jesus if the crowds did tell us to shut up every time we went onto the street or into the workplace wherever actually I think we probably would I think something's happening in this church that isn't going to stop People speaking the name of Jesus. I really do believe that. As it gets harder, we cry out more. My heart is to see this church grow. My heart is that unbelievers would be in this gathering on a Sunday, hearing the name of Jesus spoken and preached about in our hearing. That doesn't mean dumbing down or making us seeker sensitive or be employing some attractional church model. It simply means that when we come to church, we want the unbelief to see who we are and what we do and why we love Jesus and why we love preaching and why we love singing and why we love crying out Hosanna and hallelujah and speaking the name of Jesus. It means that we have to think about the language that we use. It means about sort of just taking time to explain things through and to be hospitable and to be welcoming and to be ready to receive the lost into this place. The sanctuary cannot just be a sanctuary from the horrible stuff out there for an hour. Let me just come in and just go, oh, let me, just, let me just, just kind of have some peace and quiet. It doesn't seem to be how the Bible works. It doesn't seem to be what God wants. He wants this place to be messy because he wants people to see messed up sinners who've been saved by the grace of God worshipping him in spirit and in truth. He wants to see depth and meat and reality to the teaching and the application of the Bible. Let me give you three applications for that then we're on to the third point. We, they, will be, they will be brief. Let me give you three things that you can do to welcome the lost and the blind into our church. Sell. Have I heard of cell? C-E-L-L. -L. Stands for come early, leave late. Come early, 
leave late. Look, we've got to get out of the habit of rocking up late for church. We've got to get into this place early. Some of you are here early because some of you have been here, have been setting up, but get here for quarter past ten. Be ready to welcome, be ready to ask somebody how God's, what God's been doing in their lives. Come early, leave late. Don't leg it after the service. Stay. That's why we put the kettle on, so that you can have some hospitality. You don't have to get that. You, you, you can stay in here. You don't have to go over there. But leave late. Come early, leave late. That's the first thing. Second thing, make sure the children come to church. Make sure the children come to church. I hope I don't embarrass this, this dear lady, but um, Christine's going to have a baby in a few weeks' time. Hey. Yeah, we're pleased about that, aren't we? Hey. Are we ready to serve Brian and Christine to make sure that as soon as they are able... They're able to bring their children to church. But new baby, lack of routine, and Brian as well. I mean, <laughs> it's all going on. But there was this article in the Evangelical Times this week. Let me just quote it. It's talking about how do you decide, how do parents decide what their kids should watch on telly and what they should listen to, all this. But they said, this is, there's one decision you can make as a Christian parent that is easy. It's a no-brainer, in fact. This is, I'm quoting this. You should take your kids to church. Not a few times a year, not once a month, not every other week. Your children should know exactly where they will be every time Sunday rolls around again. Your kids need a foundation of consistent biblical influence. They need an extended family of people to love them, teach them, guide them, pray for them, and show them all of the ways to be a follower of Christ. Prioritize. Oh, end of quote. Going on to my stuff there. So, sell, bring the kids, or the grandkids, get them in. We want them here. Third one is priority, prioritise prayer. Prioritise prayer. As I said at the start, the numbers at our prayer meeting are pretty, pretty lousy for a church of our size at the moment. We're in a battle. We're in a battle. Jesus has won the battle on the cross, but it goes on. You need to be here. Come and pray. Join a life group. Some of you are waiting to be put in life groups. I know we're having conversations with some of you, but get involved. Don't just make it about an hour on a Sunday. Get involved. Come early, leave late. Bring the kids and prioritise prayer in the life of the church um so here's the crowd trying to shut this persistent cry of bartimaeus up but here's your palm sunday uh, application which we'll look at tonight in chapter 11 verse 9 on palm sunday itself you'll notice that the crowds who were shutting him up are now the ones shouting out exactly what bartimaeus was was shouting save me have mercy on me Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew says, Hosanna to the Son of David. Everything that Bartimaeus was crying out, now the crowd is crying out as Jesus is in Jerusalem. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said to him, call him. And they called the man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. When you hear the name of Jesus spoken, he will stop and he will listen and he will respond as you ask him to come into your life. More on that in just a second. So that's the long point. Here's point number three. So we've seen his pitiful, his pitiful case. We've seen his uh, persistent cry. Thirdly, his personal cost. The personal cost to Bartimaeus coming into uh, the, the work of the Lord Jesus. Verse, uh, verse 50. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus Three interesting things happen here. Are you still with me? Are you ready for these three interesting things? Awesome, thank you. Two of you are, that's good. <laughs> Number one, he throws off his cloak, does blind Bartimaeus. How curious. I wonder why Mark told us that bit of information. Why does he do that? I mean, on one hand, it's just Mark telling us what happened, isn't it? It's just a bit of good reporting, just a good bit of journalism. But think about it, it's likely, this cloak is likely the only thing of any value, of any worth, that Bartimaeus has, his cloak. It's all he's got. And, and Mark wants us to know that he throws, I mean, it's quite a violent action, he takes it off and he throws it down, that word thrown, ekbalo in Greek, to throw away, to, to cast off, how Jesus cast out demons, similar word. It's quite deliberate. Throwing off his cloak. Bartimaeus is intentional. 
this is the this is this is the uh, the important stuff I want you to let filter in through your ears and into your heart this morning. I think Bartimaeus is saying this: if if I can have Jesus, I don't need anything else. I don't even need a cloak. I don't need anything. All I want is Jesus. There's a hymn that many of you will know, Rock of Ages, and I think it's the third, might be the fourth verse. It says this, listen to these words. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, saviour, or I die. I don't need my cloak if I'm clinging to Jesus and his work on Calvary's cross. And you see, Barty knows that he must come to Jesus as he is. No cloak necessary. No covering. No attempt to cover his state, his beggarly, pitiful state. No, uh, what does it say there in the hymn? Empty-handed, simply, naked, helpless, dirty, Nothing. I just come. I, I can't hide. I can't hide the horror of my sin. I can't see it because my eyes are blind. But you can see my heart. You can see I've fallen so short of you, you Lord God. This is the beauty of the gospel this morning. There's no shame here. There is no shame here. It does not matter if you are a blind beggar. Or a billionaire baron. You come in the same way. Nothing in your hand. Clinging to the cross. Naked coming to Jesus to give you his righteous cloak. Helpless looking to him for grace. Realising you're foul needing a wash in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bold baron, pitiful beggar. You come the same and there's no shame in this place. Because we are all recovering from sin and rejoicing in the saviour who did that for us if you were with me for discipleship explored this thursday you should be thinking back to philippians chapter 3 christ is all my righteousness not my cloak not my possessions not my stuff not my status not my rank not my wife not my kids not my whatever christ is all my righteousness so he threw off his cloak then he sprang up I was thinking about this, I wonder when the last time was that a blind beggar Barty th- sprang up for anything. But that's what happens when you become a Christian. When you throw off that old burden, burdensome cloak, the weight of your effort and good works, all the stuff you're trying to do in your own self-righteousness, you chuck that old thing away and suddenly you can spring up again. Wow. And then it says, thirdly, he came to Jesus. Oh, I love that. He came to Jesus... Jesus hasn't even healed his sight yet. He's not even done what he wants yet. And he comes. This is amazing faith. Wow. If this goes wrong, Bartimaeus, if Jesus doesn't heal you, or if Jesus is having an off day, Jesus doesn't have off days, by the way, but Bartimaeus doesn't know that. If this is going to, you are going to lose Whatever little last bit of shred of dignity you had made. <laughs> this had better not go pear-shaped for you today. This is incredible faith. But the very fact that Jesus has called him is enough. He knows even if he doesn't get cured of his blindness, the prayer, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, that's been answered. That's all he wants, the mercy and the grace and the attention of Jesus. That's all he needs Jesus has had mercy on Bartimaeus just by stopping and taking notice of the most pitiful beggar there is. And so he throws down his cloak and goes to Jesus. By the way, here's another Palm Sunday link. The disciples, you'll see this tonight, will throw their cloak, same language, over the colt that Jesus will sit on. And then the crowds will take their cloaks and spread them on the ground for Jesus to ride the donkey into Jerusalem on. Bartimaeus is setting the tone for the start of Easter week. Number four, the powerful cure. The powerful cure, verses 51 and 52a. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, 
let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. You see, someone might say, if I get healed from cancer, if I get the promotion, if I can just get married, if I can just have children, then I'll trust Jesus. But God doesn't owe you anything. You can't wait for God to do something for you in order to get something back, uh, in order to give him something back. Do you you get that? Jesus does not owe blind Bartimaeus his sight. He doesn't owe him his sight, not his physical sight. In fact, he doesn't owe him his soul sight either. He owes him nothing. But God does give us, in our hearing, the knowledge that we are blind. And he graciously gives us the cure. That's what Easter is all about, isn't it? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners So we come as we are this morning, wretched, pitiful and blind. And he does the rest. Final point. Look at his preferred course. Bartimaeus' preferred course. Verse 52b. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. That's fascinating. Bartimaeus now follows Jesus. I wonder how far. He followed him for. I wonder if he just followed him to the edge of Jericho, to the city gate. That's far enough. Now I just need to go back to my family and tell them I can see. I just need to go and get a shower. just need to go and get a change of clothes. I wonder, as we creep into chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, Now they drew near to Jerusalem. I wonder if that they includes formerly blind Bartimaeus. I wonder if Bartimaeus has continued beyond Jericho for the 15 miles into Jerusalem. I rather think he probably does. But I wonder if it's even more than that. I wonder, actually, if you just turn, if you've got a Bible, to Luke chapter 23. Listen to what happens in Luke chapter 23. This is Good Friday stuff. We're jumping ahead to Good Friday And Jesus is hanging on the cross almost dead. Luke chapter 23, verses 44 to 49, says this. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, now it's Jesus calling out, that's another sermon, careful, Jonathan. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances, some some versions say friends, that's a better word, all his friends and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking to myself, in verse 48, was Bartimaeus one of the crowd that assembled for the spectacle and then went home beating his breast? Or was he even one of the friends who stood with the women watching these events from afar? You see, if Jesus has done such a wonderful thing in your life as save you from your sin and show you the horror of that and open your blind eyes, then you're going to go with him right to the end, yeah? You're not just going to go so far and say, that's far enough, let me now just go and get on with my business. You're going to go all the way to the cross. In fact, for you, it starts at the cross when you come as a sinner to Jesus. How far are you willing to follow Jesus? Is Jesus just a name from history that is good fun, good sport to debate with those sad Christians when they start shouting and speaking the name of of, of Jesus? (laughs) Is he just a name? Do you follow him maybe to church just for an hour or so on a Sunday? Maybe it's more than that. Maybe you even come early and leave late. Maybe it's a bit more as following Jesus. Maybe you will get baptised and take communion and even commit to serve in the church. Or maybe you will say this Palm Sunday, I will go wherever Jesus wants me to go and I will not stop until he tells me to stop and I will not stop, that means, until I get to heaven with him one day. Friends, at the very least this morning, you've heard the name of Jesus spoken in your hearing So please come to him. He's near. He's near to each one of us this morning. 
and he's ready to stop on the, wo- on the road and to meet you at your point of need. Oh, this Easter week, it's the week to speak Jesus, to speak Jesus in your family, to speak Jesus over your circumstances, to speak the name of Jesus into the context that you go. It might be that for you, you need someone to speak the name of Jesus and his saving work into your life. But respond this morning. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Music group, just come up. Let's, uh, let's just get ready to land this in worship. Because there is so much power in the name of Jesus, isn't it? So much power in the name of Jesus. And those of us that believe in his name know that. And we see the wonders and the works of the Lord Jesus just by looking at our own hearts and our own lives. We see that as we look around and we see a gathering in the place this morning. My heart for us as a church is that we are a church that speaks out the name of Jesus. Let's worship together.